Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Dorothea Kleine and I'm the co-director of the Institute for Global Sustainable Development at the University of Sheffield and my fellow co-director co Dan Brockington is also here and we are just really excited to see this event come off. Um, basically the things that we do here at IGSD has a lot to do with interdisciplinary dialogue and I think this event um, really showcases that that intention very well. We're very lucky to have Melissa Gatta as um, one of our group of colleagues um, who with her expertise um, not just in um, Middle Eastern studies but also specifically in the spatial temporal politics of displacement has really curated this event. And so um, we were excited to hear about the, um, the plans for this event. We've been hearing about it quite a bit. Um, we've heard about the exciting speakers um, that um, Melissa has invited. And we're really grateful um, to those uh, speakers who are joining us um, from different countries. I guess the online um, format also allows that very nicely. And um, we're looking forward to a really rich um, exchange and the rich discussion afterwards across disciplines, um, across cultures. And this is really goes to the heart of what we're trying to do at the Institute. Um, so a big welcome everyone and a big thank you to Melissa and the speakers already. I'm looking forward to the discussions that we're going to have. So thanks everyone for coming and let's enjoy this. Thank you so much, Dorothea. Um, so we're going to, we'll have a little bit of housekeeping first and then we'll get into the conversation. Um, just a bit more about me, as Dorothea said, I am a postdoc at the IGSD. I'm currently working on a project funded by the GCRF um, that looks at the impact of the pandemic on um, refugees and host communities in Jordan. It's called PPE and Refugees. Um, but more broadly, I have um, looked at time and space in displacement. And um, next year, uh, I'll have a book out on the politics of time in Azraq based on my PhD research. So I'm very, very excited to be speaking with uh, Sharam, Karam, and Anne today um, and continue exploring this very fascinating topic. Um, and it's also why I'm very, very excited to see so many um, both familiar and new uh, faces with us tonight. Um, the first event as IGSD, formerly SID. Um, so I speak um, from a personal perspective, but also on behalf of um, IGSD when I say that it's great to welcome you all here tonight. Um, Often when we talk about displacement, we're talking about space, the word place is in the word, um, but displacement is also a temporal experience. So um, this panel is aiming to put time and space together in conversation. We have three amazing scholars with us today who have contributed to understandings of both the spatial and temporal dimensions of displacement. Um, so we'll be drawing on some of their um, research, but also lived experiences in displacement, um, examining temporal themes like waiting and uncertainty alongside spatial themes like um, border crossings and humanitarian spaces. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to Sarah Fine. Um, I don't know if she's here today. Uh, she is um, at Cambridge and she moderated an, an event last year called On Time and it very much inspired tonight's format and she was key in kind of helping me um, kind of shape uh, the, the event um, today. Um, one last little note is that I do ask our audience um, to hold your questions and refrain submitting questions in the chat box until we open to the Q&A. So we'll have about an hour of conversation with our three speakers and then the rest of the time will hopefully be to hear from you guys, hear your comments, um, but please do wait until we open that up. Um, just out of respect to our speakers and to um, other audience members as um, it does make a noise every time you uh, submit something in the chat box and it can be a bit distracting. Um, we will be having my colleague Migna Mehta as well. She is uh, here with us supporting, um, moderating the questions. Um, so she'll be taking care of, of that section of the event. And you can also use the hand raising button um, to uh, ask your question towards the end. And you can find that um, along the bottom of your screen next to the um, video button. Um, but we will remind you of that as well uh, when we get to the Q&A. Um, I do also want to note that on Google Meet, um, it can be a little bit overwhelming if you have lots of faces on the screen right now. So you can, uh, if you go down to the three dots at the bottom of your screen, 
and click change layout, uh, you can um, kind of minimize it to maybe six speakers and hopefully you would get a bigger view of, of our speakers today. Um, so I want to go ahead and start introducing our speakers and I do ask that each of you uh, gives us a little wave when I mention your name so people can find you on their screens. Um, so first we have uh, Professor Sharom Khosravi, uh, who, hello, is a former taxi driver and currently an accidental professor of anthropology at Stockholm University. His recent publications are Waiting, a project in conversation, which came out with Columbia University Press in 2020. And um, his next book is called Seeing Like a Smuggler, which will be out this year. Welcome, Sharon. Um, we also have Dr. Anne-Christine Zunz, who is a lecturer in anthropology of development at the University of Edinburgh. She is an economic anthropologist with a focus on the intersections of labor, forced migrations, and gender in the Mediterranean. Since 2015, Anne has conducted fieldwork with displaced Syrians across the MENA region. Uh, fluent in Levantine Arabic, she specializes in research with displaced populations in hard to reach rural areas and with refugee women. And she was principal investigator of the AHRC project, Refugee Labor Under Lockdown Project. Um, project, and she's begun a new AHRC project called Feel Songs, which will investigate the potential of Syrian refugees' traditional harvesting songs and intangible cultural heritage for informing sustainable development policies in the Middle East, which sounds fascinating. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Karam Yahya, who was born in Damascus, Syria. Um, in 2013, Karam graduated from Hashma University in Jordan with a BA in Literature and Cultural Studies and started his professional career with Action Aid ARI as a community mobilizer in Zathri refugee camp. Karam worked as cultural mediator and translator for the Afin Project, which stands for Effective and Cultural Dimension of Integration Following Forced Migration and Immigration at the Free University of Berlin. Karam is also a Humanity in Action Senior Fellow from the 2017 Berlin Fellowship Program and is finishing his master's studies at Humboldt University Berlin, um, where he wrote a thesis titled Liminality and the Protracted Refugee Situation, a qualita qualitative study of Syrian refugees living in Germany. He's also authored a chapter in the edited volume called Stealing Time, uh, which came out last year with Bristol University Press. So welcome to all three speakers. Um, and I want to jump straight in. So I've kind of, um, the way I have organized today's conversation is in roughly four parts or four themes. And the first one starts to zone in on, on time itself, why we're looking at time. Um, so I want to invite first Sharom to, to bring us into this topic. You've had a long track record of examining time and displacement and migration with lots of important work on waiting and um, bordering politics, for example. So I was hoping you could kick us off with um, the importance of looking at time. So how has the conversation around time in migration changed within this field? And what made you interested in, in looking at it? Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you, Melissa and others for organizing this event. Um, let me start with um, saying a few words about uh, why I include my taxi job in my bio. Uh, it is a kind of acknowledgement of knowledge produced outside academia, which is not usually included in, in the academic knowledge production. And when it comes to time and my research on time, the experience and knowledge during years of taxi driving has been very crucial. M moving around in the city is, is a lot about time. It's about how, as Sara Sharma put it, you recalibrate your time to other people's time, to the customers, to the you know, other drivers, etc. And also I could see uh, different aspects of time in relation to space, you know, queues, waiting, uh, waiting for customers, etc. So, so time always been there. Um, 
And when it comes to the, the case of displacement, so, uh, uh, so I realized uh, during uh, my research on, on migration and border studies uh, that, that uh, uh, bordering practices, uh, which is, uh, you know, includes uh, more practices than practices on the actual line between states, um, includes a lot of time and manipulation of time and temporalities. Bordering practices uh, is about uh, regulation of time, keeping people in waiting, delaying them, and, and putting them in circulation, yeah? sending back to them to, to the square one again and again and again. Um, so temporal borders and temporal borderings is, is, is a kind of, of uh, differential inclusion um, and, uh, and also exclusion of people. And for me, it, 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 this appeared to me as, as a problem, as a question, uh, when I visited the detention center outside uh, Stockholm uh, in Sweden, uh, and in the main hall, uh, I saw different uh, uh, different clocks on the wall showing different time zones, um, time zones which belong to the uh, regions where deportees were supposed to deport to. So for me, it was very interesting and very clear explicit signal that it which was about temporal disbelonging that these people do not belong to this place these people do not belong to this time either yeah so this temporal disbelonging was very clear signal through clocks so so how about this uh, uh, which for me was very clear, uh, you know, linked to the temp uh, to colonial racism, which was based on denial of coevalness, that we are in different temporalities, yeah? That, that uh, you know, imagination of, of there are different temporalities and, and civilized uh, uh, progressive Europeans uh, belong to white time, and then we have other times who non-Europeans belong to. And Franz Fanon put it very clearly that, that the black man, the black, black person arrive to the white time and he, he and she arrives always too late, yeah? So this belatedness is very, is very central in, in keeping this temporal bordering and uh, temporal uh, bordering practices of differential inclusions. Um, so, so this, uh, the, the, Malaysia, please stop me when my time is. Okay, I know that it was about five minutes to introduce. Yeah, is it already considered? You have another minute if yeah. you want to get going because I, I like this train of thought. So please, of course, yeah, very sure. Um, so, so, um, uh, so this denial of, of coevalence and, and sense of belatedness is, is very much, it's not about existential identity or, you know, existential stuckedness, you know, that life doesn't go anywhere. It, it is very much about uh, access to resources, yeah? So how, how much this belatedness or, or keeping people belated, yeah, uh, or, or re reproducing this, this idea of people are, are arriving too late um, is, is about to keep them, uh, their access to resources, to healthcare, to education, to labor market, you know, limited. And, uh, so it is about very much about control of uh, access to resources. Thank you for that. I really like this um, idea that's coming through, which is that um, 
the temporal bordering is often almost an invisible practice um, and on certain bodies. Um, and we'll definitely continue with this throughout the, uh, the hour. Um, but Anne, I wanted to turn to you because you've done your own work on waiting and um, cyclical migration. So how has time resonated with your work? Okay, well, thank you, Shaham, for setting the scene so nicely. I feel you've touched on many different aspects of temporalities and displacement. So if that's okay, I'll just pick out one of these, which relates to your, your experience as a taxi driver. And that's the idea of both of familiar familiarity with places and people, but also the idea of ongoing mobility. Um, because I feel like, I feel that in the research I've been doing so far, time has come up in different ways, but often with regard to refugees, families and kinship networks and a shared sense of belonging, and also families plan to reunite the family in the future. So let me just give you two examples. I did my PhD field work between 2015 and 2017 in Mafraq, which is a border town in northern Jordan, which I think Karam will know very well. And it was an interesting moment and a heartbreaking moment to do fieldwork with Syrian refugees because it was a time when the Jordanian border was closing, so less people were coming in, but also the people who were already there were re-evaluating their prospects for return because it had become clear that no one would go home anytime soon, so people were starting to think about um, other ways. Um, out of Jordan was reassessing their prospects. But then when I lived in Mafraq, I realized that actually I had to get out of this crisis narrative because in fact, there was a much more longstanding Syrian presence in the town, which was often overlooked by humanitarian actors. And that was the fact that much like in many places in Lebanon, Northern Jordan had a longstanding history of circular labor migration between Syria and Jordan. So many of the people that I interviewed as Syrian refugees from 2015 onwards had actually come to the town decades earlier as labor migrants and had now returned and then sometimes brought their entire family. And I think this is what got me interested in the more complex temporalities that underpin displacement. And in that regard, often displacement for the people I talk to is not just a one-way street and not just a linear process. Often it's embedded into these complex and circular and more long-standing mobilities, but also circular temporalities. And we're seeing this again. So since 2019, and Melissa kindly mentioned this in the introduction, I've been doing fieldwork with Syrian academics in agriculture, with Syrian refugees who work as agricultural workers in, in different places in the Middle East. And one thing we see there is that many people are refugees, but they continue to be mobile because, for example, they work as seasonal workers in agriculture and they follow the seasons between different agricultural work sites. See, like, for example, the Jordan Valley in northern Jordan or different parts of Turkey. And what's interesting there is that, again, this is about familiarity with places, familiarity with people, because these agricultural workers still work with their fam family members, and they're also often recruited by people from their own families, but also ongoing mobility in displacement. Only that in their particular case, they've also entered increasingly globalized agricultural businesses. So now they have to also come to terms with the whole different set of temporalities, which is the brutal temporalities of global supply chain capitalism and its high frequency pressures, right? And that's something we saw in the at the beginning of the pandemic when all of a sudden there were lockdowns and um, workers couldn't get to the fields and agricultural products couldn't go to the markets. And as a result, a lot of Syrian refugee farm workers lost their jobs. So I think, Melissa, to just give a brief answer to your question, I think the way time has featured in my research is on the one hand, these ideas of like more longstanding migrations and ideas of familiarity and ways of how people make family, especially across borders and across multiple places. But on the other hand, how they get in touch with these other more global and brutal temporalities, be it migration infrastructures or be it capitalism. Thank you, Anne, for that. That was very interesting. And thanks for the example. Um, I think you, you built on what Sharon was saying very well when you talk about displacement is not a linear experience. Um, it's much more complex in terms of time and temporality. Um, and Karam, I wanted to bring it now to you. Um, you focused on liminality, this idea of kind of being stuck. So I was hoping you could bring more of that into this conversation and, and why you looked at that specifically mm -hmm. in the book chapter. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I actually won't take from uh, Anne and then also reflect on, on Shara because she was talking about Mafraq, where it is, you know, I, I've been, I, I was living in Jordan before uh, what happened in Syria. And um, the fact that we are talking about time and the change of time have happened kind of uh, in front of my eyes because I was kind of 
you know, a student in, in Jordan and, and um, actually some of my professors are still uh, right now uh, watching and I didn't see them since that long. So everything is related to, to me, uh, uh, to that change. Because uh, when I was in Jordan, I, I always reflect on what I kind of lived and see the people living. Working in Zatari camp have been different, for example, for me, it is uh, the area north, uh, um, north of Jordan, south of Syria, where it is Mafraq. Uh, when I started working in the camp, uh, Zatari camp, it, it is like my community, you know, the Syrian community. So it was for me more like looking of what is happening to the people that I, I come from there, but I wasn't there. So kind of the, the time changed for them, but it's for me still running normally uh, uh, because I was living somewhere else. And and that from that from that thing that I've, I've realized there is something different, but I didn't really uh, felt what they feel actually in, in the Zatari camps. Even though we come from the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, reflecting also of what uh, Anne say, the, the uh, people who come from Dara, south of, south of Syria, they actually have cousins who live in, in Mafraq. You know, they are the same family, but some of them are Syrians, some of them are Jordanians. It's like uh, three kilometers far. Uh, so there is no natural borders, as you know. Um, so how I reflect about it is more because I have seen this and that was why I'm interested in time. It was because I, 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 there should be a way to conceptualize this difficult living lived experiences of the, of, of the people who are living in the camps because me coming from the same country and not living the same difficulty that they're facing because of that change how how uh, Shahram also put it that uh, you are just late or you are um, looked at in a different way because you just came into a uh, in a different kind of time time zone, which is a refugee uh, So, so it is so much related, and I, I can always reflect on it and see that uh, people were, all, of course, in in a, in a move. They were always feel that they have to prove something to the um, uh, to us, <laughs> who, whoever who is not living in the camp, and and, and then. Um, Sure, as person also on me, the, 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 my living experience and my, my, my time have been affected in this way because, I, uh, of course, after, after being a Syrian Jew, of course, I have my community and everybody in Jordan, which I, I am really happy that uh, I belong to, to, to the community there. But at the same time, government do not know me kind of personally, you know, like I, I, of course, if you are coming from a place, it's not necessarily Syria, it could be Afghanistan, it could be anywhere where a war happened or a disaster, and then you are, uh, feel, I was explaining actually to a friend of mine that I didn't know why I felt after 2011 that my driving license, the Syrian driving license, do not count anymore. I'm afraid to drive <laughs> after this because then if I'm stopped by a, by a, by a police man, uh, then I will have a different concentrations in my mind. So, of course, that's how I think I can bring how, how time change from this point. Because uh, it meant to me a lot and there was something I don't understand and I have to process a lot and or realize a lot before knowing that it actually studies about time. <laughs> so, um, bo both things, of course, it comes and it, it came later with my living experience, uh, lived experience in Turkey or in Greece or so on. I started to feel the same. I started to realize, okay, uh, 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 if I was in the camp, and that's what some uh, Syrian uh, intellectuals bring, that we are not only uh, refugees, we are also survivors. So I survived and I was in Jordan, but then I also was late somehow uh, when I came to Europe. Uh, and then you, of course, have to stop at this point and, and think, uh, okay, uh, why, why, <laughs> why there is a difference? Is it only cultural or it's economical or, or, or... yeah, so many questions, it brings so many questions. Thank you, Karam. And I, I do want to continue on this, this thread, but I want to pick up on something you said, which is this idea that you were basically witnessing time as, as different for other people, even though they were also Syrian. Um, and, and this brings together, I think, all three of your work, um, which has 
um, looked at waiting um, as somehow, or time as stolen from refugees. Waiting is theft, um, is the word that Karam uses in his book chapter, um, in various spaces. So the refugee camp or um, the boat to Greece or uh, European borders. Um, and I want to quote uh, something from Karam's chapter where basically you're describing at this point, you have um, yourself reached Europe and you've gone back to um, various points along that journey, this time as a humanitarian volunteer. And you describe how you feel when you see people arriving um, uh, by boat. Um, and you said they had just arrived on a boat surviving so many illogical problems that it was difficult to tell them about a structured system that might still place them in the midst of violence. Um, and I thought this was really important because you're bringing in here the idea again of time being stolen, but um, in a in a in a structurally violent manner, right? Through the bureaucratic European systems that are still ahead of them, that they still don't know that they're going to have to confront um, being told to come back tomorrow every single day. So I was hoping you could speak more about this, um, uh, Karam, about the structural violence and um, witnessing others as well um, go through the same. Yeah, of course, I, I can uh, continue from uh, where Melissa you left it. Uh, you meaning uh, I was in a rescue mission in uh, with a, a German organization called Jugendrettet. Uh, I was already somehow one and a half year in Germany. Um, I have volunteered and I was always because I want to witness, I want to see uh, how like yeah, I, I didn't feel that I have to leave this behind me. So I joined the ship Juventa which, by the way, now it's seized in, in Italy, so uh, um, that's a different story. But yeah, uh, being on the ship, it was, of course, a moment that I have to stop because I myself came by boat uh, for various reasons. This is also a, <laughs> a different narration, but when I was on the ship actually doing the rescue, the, rescue, the rescuing, uh, I was imagining, like, how... Actually, the most have came to my mind at that point is what came to my mind when I was on the boat uh, in December 2014. When we were in a boat, we were like around 47 people. And I still remember what I've been thinking at that point. I was thinking that I just want to touch the floor again. I, I want to uh, arrive to Earth again, wherever. <laughs> I mean, take me back, take me uh, forward. Just like I want to be uh, uh, on Earth again. And I thought when I was making the rescue uh, and, and giving the life jackets to the people, that this is the moment, of course, where I was thinking that's the reason why I should be there, to give people another chance, because I asked for it before. And... Um, but still, of course, back to your point that I about people do not know when when you they are coming. Especially, I was uh, in the Mediterranean uh, waiting people coming from Libya. So people who are migrating, I mean, ninety nine percent. I don't want to completely say they don't know, but people we don't know what the system wait uh, bring for us here in Europe. You come here and you don't know all of the, like when I remember when I first heard that, oh, you have to be, uh, if you want help with the German bureaucracy, I was like, what bureaucracy you're talking about? We're coming from Syria and like, we have a, and then I discovered that I actually do not understand even that that, that it is a bureaucracy that functions <laughs> in, in, in my country in the right way. I mean, so of course, people who are coming by boat and running all of this way from, from Nigeria, from Chad, from everywhere, and going, they won't be thinking that, oh, we will wait for our res for our, you know, decision that we're refugees or not. And then this is how we are defined later. Last thing I would say about when, of course, I got my um, uh, refugee status in Germany. I was in Bayern in like five months, six months. Uh, and the same time there was a person from Iran who waited for 13 years. 13 years for for something I got in, in five, five months. Of course, we always invite to improve these uh, policies that make people uh, back to kind of reality uh, as fast as possible. But 
still that's that's a structural violence that's the time that you feel stuck in and you don't know it's facing something you are not prepared to thank you karam um yeah. Shalom, i'd like to invite you to comment on that you've written a lot about stolen time so please add your thoughts um yes thank you karam um, um for your input uh stolen time if we think that time is the dimension of life along uh, space then what happens when people are forced to 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 uh to move uh, or are displaced or are deported and this idea of um, stolen time um, came to me during um, a research I did among um, Afghans who have been deported from Europe to Kabul. And the, the question emerged as what happened to all time people have used, have invested, have saved, have spent you know, all these ter terms we use for money, you know, exactly the same terms we use for time. Um, during the time they have been in Europe, yeah? So, so when people are removed from spaces, especially removed, some amount of time is also removed, yeah? So that was my question. What happens to the time people invest in, you know, working, learning a language, establishing uh, social relations, you know, maybe falling in love, you know, uh, finding friends, uh, etc. So all these uh, forms of capitals, yeah, what happens to them when people are removed, yeah, from one place to another? And um, when it comes to mass deportation, when it comes to you know, talking about uh, millions, hundreds of thousands of people who are, who are uh, deported every year, for example, from Iran to Afghanistan or from the United States to, 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 to uh, other countries. So, so if we calculate all hours, days, weeks, months, you know, people have been working in these countries, and then they are deported. Yeah? They have lived in these countries and then they are deported. So who takes all these times? Employers who don't pay salaries, wages, states who don't pay uh, unused holidays or you know uh, all social benefits, money people have been paying. Um, People have uh, consumed, people have uh, bought, you know, lands, houses, etc., and now they are deported. Who take them? You know, it's it's very simple question about, you know, money in one way. Who takes this money? So it's, it's about, I, I wanted to use a stealing because it is a stealing, you know, how, you know, stealing. I think it's, it's important to use a stealing as a verb to, to emphasize uh, that someone is stealing something from others, yeah? So it should not be invisibilized through, you know, my bordering policies, you know, political debate about migration, nation state system, etc. cetera. Um, so, so the idea about stealing of time comes from there. But also, you know, um, it is very much what, what Karam talked about. You know, it's about uh, two, two kinds of, you know, uh, what, what happens to keep people in waiting, you know. And, and when we talk about waiting, we talk not about one year or two years. The average time to be in refugee condition, 1996 was, nine years yeah today it's about 20 years so so how how keeping people you know and and when you look at uh, dada refugee camp in north of kenya 
established 1989 and still in, in, in working today. So, so it's three generation, you know, so, so or, or thinking about Palestinian refugees, you know, displaced people. Now, how many, how many generations are kept in waiting, you know, and delaying, you know, their arrivals, yeah? So, so bureaucracy, of course, is, is very much part of this, yeah? And, um, uh, bureaucracy is part of invisibilizing the stealing, yeah? And that you, you, how, how you, uh, how you, um, how you present it as a bureaucratic process. In fact, it's a stealing uh, of, of people's resources, people's life. I mean, I mean we, on the one hand, we have a, a quantitative aspect of, you know, how we calculate times, bureaucratic time, weeks, days, etc. cetera. Um, this is what ancient Greeks called chronos. And, and uh, another is qualitative, qualitative aspect, the quali quality of time, yeah, kairos, yeah. So, so what, what happens here is taking away kairos. Kairos is, is the moment of, of uh, you know, events. It's a moment of uh, something can happen, an opening in history that these people can, you know, liberate themselves or, you know, the time of emancipation. Uh, so, so how this bureaucratic uh, time is pushing away this quality of time, this kairos, taking away uh, kairos from uh, refugees. Yeah, thank you. You bring up a lot of good um, points here, um, that it isn't just amount of years, it's also what people could have done in those in those years um, to, you know, careers or education, um, or building a family or whatever. Um, but I, I especially like your point on the fact that time is currency, it is something we talk about in a very capitalist kind of way. And Anne, I think you'll have probably a lot to say on that from your own work. So please, uh, yeah, I think I really like this idea, Shaham's idea of stolen time in the sense that stolen time is not just empty waiting time. It's, as Shaham said, um, people do all kinds of things while they're waiting at borders or while they're waiting for bureaucracy. And in many places, they already work and they create surplus value. They create profit, but the profit does not go to refugees or does not go to asylum seekers. Um, so the question is, where does it go? And as Shaham said, everything is time is about money. And one thing we found is with um, Syrian agriculture workers is one way that stolen time manifests itself in people's life is through debt, through debt relationships. So the people we do research with are agriculture workers who like often recruited by intermediaries who come from the same families. And what happens is that um, they often get an advance payment from the intermediary at the beginning of the agricultural season that they then pay back um, throughout the season. But at the same time, the intermediary is also often the landlord. Sometimes they do the food shopping for refugees. Sometimes they provide for, like more informal credits. At the end of the season, as a refugee farm worker, often you end up in a situation where you have a very complex financial, financial relationship with different competing timelines and, and temporalities. And you end up poorer than you started the season. You end up with, le with like very few savings, or maybe you end up with even more debts than you started the agricultural season. But what's even crazier in this story is that we also interviewed agricultural intermediaries who, again, are also often Syrians, either former labor migrants or Syrian refugees themselves, and often from the same families as the Syrian workers. Now, you could think these guys are apparently the bad guys in the story, right? Because they're exploiting Syrian refugees. But what's actually happening is that many of these intermediaries also come out of this with a net loss because they get so sucked up in these complicated financial relationships and relationships of debts and debts they might incur towards employers and towards other landlords and so on, that they also, that even for them, often being intermediary ends up being a losing game. And I find this really interesting because it clearly shows here, clearly we see people um, who are already working, right? Um, while being in a very precarious and unstable situation. Um, whose work ends up looking like other forms of indentured labor around the world in other globalized economies and whose stolen time clearly creates a lot of profit somewhere for agricultural businesses, but in their own lives ends up being dead.
Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, that's a really uh, important example, I think, bringing in the agricultural context where time is organized now also uh, seasonally. It's it's a different type of timeline um, in addition to all of the temporalities of displacement that many of these um, workers are, are experiencing. Um, and so with that, I kind of want to start transitioning into another uh, theme, which is how do we go beyond waiting? You said the time that's stolen isn't empty time. We've, we've uh, explored that from three different examples. Um, so how do we kind of take that step? And I'm going to come back to you, Anne, and um, maybe ask, you know, you, you, I think you've done a lot of great work um, reflecting, not just doing the research, but reflecting on the research process, looking at the field and anthropology um, in displacement studies, forced migration studies. So I wanted to, to start by asking how, how can we as scholars kind of engage with the displacement experience without undermining people's agency in displacement? So with time, for example, how do we push beyond, um, you know, waiting as um, stuck or displacement as a time of stuckness? Um, or as uh, Shahram told us, um, you know, displacement is more than, it's not just existential stuckness, there's a lot more um, to it. Uh, it's about access to resources. So yeah, Anne, if you could, kind of maybe start um, musing about this, how do we deal with agency then? Okay, so I think one thing we've seen, especially in the UK context, is that with the Syrian refugee crisis, a lot of funding has become available to study Syrian refugees, often not in the UK, but Syrian refugees who are still in the Middle East. And I feel, and this has been pointed out by many, that this motivates the kind of research where you have researchers from the UK who parachute in into displacement contexts, contract locals, or people from the refugee community as research assistants who then do all the work and do all the interviewing and data collection. And then all the amazing data go back to the UK and the contribution of Syrian or local academics or research assistants is, is seldom acknowledged. And I think that raises important questions about the sustainability of this kind of knowledge production and the kind of timelines. What is it if like you just parachute in, you spend two weeks on the ground and then you go out again and you write up something um, in a different language which never becomes accessible to the people who are actually the protagonists of the research. And I just wanted to reflect on some hard lessons learned from um, something we've been doing at Edinburgh, where um, we started working with the Council for At-Risk Academics, which is a British NGO that supports displaced academics and that tries to help them get their academic careers back on tracks. And through the Council for At-Risk Academics, we've met an amazing group of Syrian scholars, most of whom live in Turkey as refugees. And we've tried to formalize working with them in what's called the One Health Field Network. Um, but what we saw um, is that when you try to build up like more equitable collaborations, it obviously doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It happens with like existing power inequalities and comes raises all kind of difficulties. So, for example, if you try to bring in international funding, the funding timelines, the funding cycles of funders often don't match the lived realities of refugee scholars. So, for example, a lot of the projects we're on, you can only pay refugee scholars halfway through the project or at the end of the project. But of course, that totally ignores that for these people, displacement, the economic pressures of displacement still go on in everyday life, right? And they don't have the luxury of academic contracts in the UK where they can wait to be paid for like half a year. But the other thing we realized, especially during the pandemic, is that um, especially early in the pandemic, we realized that obviously fieldwork wasn't, ha wasn't happening because there were lockdowns in the UK, there were also lockdowns in all of the places where we usually do fieldwork. So what we did was to resort to remote data collection via WhatsApp, where our Syrian colleagues um, interviewed um, Syrian farm workers via WhatsApp, and they um, enabled them to compile WhatsApp diaries of their living and working conditions for us. And that kind of created an odd dynamic where Syrian researchers were put into this position of data collectors, which we're really in uncomfortable with because it's really important to us that they're involved in all stages of the research, um, like not just the first stage of data collection. So we've been thinking a lot about how we could address this. So I'll just switch on the light again. Um, so we've been thinking, and I think this raises some thorny questions about how you organize, for example, not just collecting data together, but also um, writing articles together and publishing together. The other issue we realized is that if the data collection um, remotely is kind of done by Syrian colleagues, then this also puts them at the forefront of like really emotional and often disturbing and like painful experiences. So we realized that for the Syrian interviews, there was real issue, like real risk of vicarious trauma, which we had to learn how to kind of absorb in a team. And that was very um, 
hard to communicate, say, between team members who were um, a Syrian academic living in Turkey and also exposed to similar living conditions and, say, an academic based in the UK. And we realized that to address this risk of vicarious trauma, you need to do a lot of relationship building in the team and you need to have a lot of informal meetings just to talk through these experiences. So just to say that um, I think there's a lot of, um, I think that during the Syrian refugee crisis we have seen, and I think I and others have tried to build more equitable teams, but it doesn't come without its pitfalls. The one other way I wanted to respond to your question is that I think one thing we realized in our team is that we're increasingly unhappy with doing refugee studies in the sense that our research focuses on people's displacement experience because the people we do research with have been refugees for like 10 years in say Turkey or Georgia and their lives have moved on. They've done all kinds of things with their lives, but also they are tired of being constantly upskilled or being treated as like humanitarian beneficiaries. So one thing we're doing in the new project, which focuses more on cultural um, heritage is to just say, what if we just stop looking at refugees as people to be upskilled who need like get one more vocational training to become the perfect farm worker? And what if we instead recognize that most of these people have been farm workers all their lives and they actually bring a lot of agricultural expertise to the table? And what would it mean if development actors could acknowledge this expertise and then just give them a voice in designing development policy? So that's maybe there's maybe also ways of reframing um, refugee displacement studies from people who constantly are constantly waiting for more training um, or more support towards people who are already experts who have long-standing knowledge and should he should have a say in their own futures. Thank you for that, Anne. That's very interesting. I like how you talk about the knowledge production. Um, that I think it's it's quite a trend right now is to include the people you're researching in the research process. But it's opened up more conversations about how how exactly that's supposed to work in a way that doesn't do do harm. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, and Karam, I wanted to come to you um, based on kind of your your book chapter. Um, you rightly describe how people in who take, who are in displacement, whether it's in Jordan or, or on the way to Europe, um, can feel as if they're powerless in a powerless position. They can feel frustrated by the bureaucracy. Um, so how do you think about agency, especially as someone who's managed to kind of challenge, um, challenge that through his own work? Uh, <laughs> it's few, uh... Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a few years of uh, thinking about how to overcome uh, these challenges, of course. Uh, I will try to uh, summarize it in a few sentences, maybe. But of course, when it comes to bringing this as a school uh, to, to, into writing or into... It, it went through phases. I, uh, of course, um, thought, of course, be, because maybe I've been a bit more exposed into, into the life there, so I thought this would mean something if I kept thinking about how to uh, um, bring it into, into something conceptual, to write it, to ex so I, but of course, sometimes you like the knowledge, that's where I think academia, uh, who who knows, help us to to be able to move on or to to give us some professors who my professors, for example, in Humboldt University, helped me a lot to um, to recognize that this uh, this lived experiences could be turned into. Um, very important uh, uh, writings or, or um, so I, I always that's why I think what I really thank you Anne for, for what you said for recognizing that yes uh, me I've been asked so many times before I go to write my masters to interview or to go in films as a refugee and it felt it felt really bad to be honest I like I don't want to uh, be um, imaged this way why why do you want to image me as a powerless person i mean uh, it was it didn't feel good it didn't it didn't just why do why do i have to emphasize the media production that is showing me in this way 
Maybe that's what I felt at that point. Or, or, or because I feel like, okay, I am now not in the right position to be shown to the others. And uh, to people who already see me, that, so why are you bringing actually <laughs> to, to, uh, to the knowledge by film or by anything? So it, was, it went for me, uh, of course, being, coming, lacking the social acknowledgement, if you can call it, is something I, I didn't feel good about because I have left social acknowledgement after a lot of uh, struggles. Uh, in the end, I moved to Jordan a bit earlier than, than the revolution in Syria. And, and, and then I um, have tried a lot to gain or through, through, through uh, academic institutions. That helped me to, um, yeah, uh, but of course, then, then later on, I, I kept to finding that is not suitable for me before I overcome this, uh, before I understand it. And then coming back to the same issue, uh, when I started working with the Free uh, University of Berlin and Charité Psychology Department, they were doing a research. They think I was actually with a friend. Um, uh, he, they were PhD candidates. They're doing research about the Syrian refugees in uh, in Berlin and then I read the questionnaire, I read the interview and I was like, I, I don't think you can ask these questions. I think I can't ask it, but you, you cannot really ask it because if you ask me these questions, I won't answer it. <laughs> I won't answer these questions because it's too personal and it touch on some places might be re-traumatizing. Of course, I got a lot of help because I, I personally, because I worked in, in field in, 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 in different, uh, you know, distress areas and, and I learned myself of, okay, this might be difficult to ask. This is too personal. So, so that's how I think it helped me, but it doesn't mean that I, it was always uh, fine for me. I, of, of course, went through phases where I felt, because the thing that I want to mention and from this point that that living these experiences or feeling in a powerless position isn't just a word. It, it is psychologically uh, difficult feeling that you get. It, it is it's related to hormones. It's relating to to real uh, uh, living like your your daily basis experience. I remember even after finishing this work and research with the, with the Fry University, it, I, it took like around six months to one year after finishing the work to also realize that I've been affected. I made like around 25 interviews. And of course, because I am from Syria, I couldn't, I, I connect emotionally with people. It's their problem is my problem. And, and uh, then uh, that's difficult. You have to take it in, in, in acknowledgement. Any, and, and with the, with the, of course, uh, being able to write about uh, my experience or this, these, how to say, new terms that happened <laughs> through migration, separation, and liminal, or, or, or also now being the thing you feel like you're in a race with, with time, to be honest, Tiani. You're moving from stage to another. Rarely you realize which stage you are in. I mean, normally you want, you just live the experience and learn the language and so on. But you see that things are going and time suddenly, oh, you are five years, six years, 10 years in the migration. You need to follow up, you know, and, and, and uh, of course, yeah, I don't know if I forgot any point, but there are many things to talk about always. <laughs> of course, yeah, thank you, Karam. I mean, I... I want to kind of emphasize the idea that you said of this, this kind of psychological impact of, of time. Um, and something I've come across in my own work is, is that time isn't just this kind of, um, you know, constantly, it's not linear, it's not this clock time, right? It's also something that we experience. And um, I think what I came across in my research is that many people felt that they could no longer take it for granted. It was something that suddenly they noticed, um, whereas on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, most of us don't really notice the passing of time. We can take it for granted. Um, and with the pandemic, that challenged all of us, I think, in many ways. Um, but I also want to go back to uh, how you were talking about challenging those narratives, often coming out of the global north, about um, 
refugees as powerless um, and, and bring that to uh, Shahram who has, um, I, I want to bring out a quote uh, from Shahram's um, afterward and ask him the question that he poses in this chapter. Um, so he wrote this in Waiting in the Temporalities of Irregular Migration which came out last year. Um, so um, uh, Sharon posed how to write about waiting in the context of migration and not contribute to the image of migration as an exceptional experience without reproducing the image of colonial relationships between powerful white people who are assumed to be able to keep black and brown migrants waiting. Um, and I think Sharon, much of your work has responded to this, uh, but I wanted to ask you this question um, and you know, how do you find the answer to that? I don't have any answer to that. It's always a, a challenge. Um, uh, how, how to do, uh, how to write, uh, how to talk about, um, you know, um, violence without reducing people to victims. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very challenging all the time. And when it comes to, um, you know, in, in terms of waiting, I, I became a little bit, um, uh, you know, worried when, when writing about waiting, how we reproduce these colonial, you know, relations, yeah, in terms of we have uh, a number of people who are waiting. They are waiting along the border. They are waiting outside the, the gate and waiting for coming, waiting to be accepted, waiting to, uh, to be integrated, to, to, uh, to get a chance to belong. So all these terminology became problematic for me, you know, integration, belonging, and, and waiting in this context. Um, so for me, that, I mean, people are coming not to belong. People are coming not to integrate. People are coming to participate. Yeah. So uh, I think you know, uh, focusing on what people do, uh, you know, working, voting, participating in in social life, in everyday life. You know, uh, it's important. You know, uh, focusing on on practices rather than, you know, reusing all this uh, state, uh, state-centric, you know, uh, concepts. When you talk to people when, who are waiting, they usually tell you that um, it, waiting time is dead time. Yeah? Nothing happens. It's, it's not life. It's just, a, you know, a, a temporary part of uh, life. So they don't see it, but but as as part of life. But when you 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 spend time with them, you know, when you see that no, this is not you know not the whole story. Yeah, um, and many things happen when people are waiting. So waiting for me is is, uh, is not uh, a term for passivity. In Arabic, I mean, Karam can correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but uh, the, the term waiting means uh, it's entazar. And entazar, etymology of entazar is coming from the verb na nazar. Nazara. Nazar. Yeah. You see, yes. So this, and, and in English, same, yeah? The etymology of waiting is, is to be watchful, watchfulness, yeah? So for me, it's, it's very much important, you know, to, to be watchful, yeah, to see, yeah, to this ability to see, this ability to, to be wakeful, yeah, uh, is very much like insomnia, yeah. I, I suffer a lot from insomnia, and I was thinking, yeah, this is very much similar to waiting, yeah. So because you, you cannot sleep and you don't know why, yeah, and you think, to find the solution for that, yeah. So, so it's a time of, you know, keep thinking, keep be wakeful, watchful, to to find the reason for your insomnia and find a way out of that. Yeah? It's very much like waiting. People in waiting are 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 very active in collecting information, in collecting, you know, uh, ideas, networking. Uh, Etc. To to find a way out of waiting, yeah. So so this 
um, um, th this uh, waiting for me is a state of consciousness. Yeah, is wakefulness. Is uh, uh, many things happening. And and in, in French, you know, the verb of uh, attender, you know, waiting means um, to direct. Uh, to be attentive and, uh, you know, uh, to, to direct one's mind towards something which is not yet happening. So, so here hope comes in so because waiting is always related to hope, yeah? Hope and waiting are two, co two sides of the same coin, yeah? Without hope, no, I mean, people don't wait, yeah? So, um, so how about, you know, thinking about waiting as an as a act of refusal? act of resistance, not accepting, uh, you know, uh, being sent back, you know. Uh, I don't accept negative decision. I try again. I, I wait again. I wait. So waiting as an active resistance to, or, or act of waiting out, yeah, waiting out, you know, and, and um, so, so, um, so for me, waiting is very interesting in this way. You know, um, not not reducing migrants uh, as passive victims of uh, Europeans' uh, bordering practices, but also, of course, they are victim of that too. Yeah, but not only. Yeah. They are, of course, you know, target of, of a brutal system of bordering practices, but they are more than that victimhood, yeah? So, so it's important to show that too, yeah? So, um, and for me, waiting as an as a, uh, analytical tool uh, is, um, op opens, you know, that window for me to, to, uh, to see uh, those aspects of, of uh, life in camps along the borders uh, after deportation. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That was that was very very interesting. I think looking at trying to keep that the active part of waiting when we're looking at waiting, I think does does work to maybe start to answer that question that you posed. Um, for the, you know, I want to start um, closing out the conversation. I'm mindful that we also are running out of time in, in, this, in this event. Um, but uh, I did want to give you guys a chance to kind of give some concluding thoughts. Um, and I'll start with you, Anne, because um, you have now current research on the pandemic. And I was hoping that you could maybe reflect on um, how you have seen even just initial thoughts, the pandemic kind of complicating or affecting temporalities of displacement that we've been we've been discussing here today. So I feel one thing the pandemic has brought to the fore and made clear to many of us is that the pandemic is not that one big singular crisis that happens in people's and many refugees' lives. What's actually what it has thrown into relief is like more long-standing processes of structural of structural marginalization. So I feel especially as we've seen with like Syrian agricultural workers. The interesting question is less why they work under such terrible conditions right now and why they're being so terribly exploited and paid so poorly. I think the interesting question is why at the very beginning of the pandemic, they were already in a precarious position, um, right? And what are the processes that put them into the position, not throughout, but at the beginning of the pandemic? Um, and just to give you an example, um, last year we did a project for which we interviewed um, 80 Syrian households that work in agriculture. And unlike many NGOs, we found that um, the rates of child and female labor in these households had not increased in the first year of the pandemic. And you might say, well, this is great, right? Clearly they're not doing that badly, but actually it means the opposite. What it means is that the people we interviewed were in many cases so poor that whoever could work in the family, including women and children, was already working at the beginning of the pandemic and before the pandemic. And I'm highlighting this because I feel that um, the pandemic has maybe helps us to think more about the temporalities of crises. Like where does the crisis lie here? And what does it mean to live in a protective crisis with no aftermath? Thank you. Um, Karam or Sharam, do you want to uh, respond to and or bring up any other concluding thoughts you might have? About pandemic. 
Yes. Yeah. If you have any, <laughs> or just general concluding thoughts. Uh, yeah, if, uh, I can I can just say that pandemic maybe somehow in the beginning of the pandemic I would say and that might not. <laughs> Yeah, I, in the beginning of the pandemic, I felt that's maybe from my point of view, just if it's not understood wrong, <laughs> that I'm happy that everybody would feel that their life stopped for one <laughs> for 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 one day, or like they were doing something and then suddenly it stopped, and then and might that might look a bit not in the right position, but. I felt like maybe then I can follow up and then like they were all late together. Not, not only refugees, not only migrants, like not only the way he's outside of, of, of the including circle, but we are all together waiting. Maybe that one, of course, with me acknowledging there are a lot of uh, things that we have to do for the pandemic, but this may be one of kind of... Uh, waiting related feeling I have got when I, I mean I finished my master thesis in the, in the pandemic so without a, that library so it was it was difficult for for sure but but yeah that that would I would say what the pandemic yeah beside uh, yeah then that's uh, including I would definitely thank uh, Munish and Victoria coming for insisting on me of uh, finishing the writing of the chapter because it was, as Shahram said, it's very difficult to write a flashback. It's not only academic, it's not only just a, a thought you write, it's both. And then it took me a lot of time to be able to bring these together. So it's really not that easy, maybe because I'm new to the academic writings, but Still, it was difficult, to be honest, to remember and to try to shape it in a meaningful way or including way to everybody. It wasn't me writing about my own. I think the experience I've lived definitely relate to too many people who cannot write and, and or cannot express that. So that's my, my word. Yes, thank you. And um, Sharon, I'm sure you have also some reflections on that as well. Um, from your own kind of writing practice. You mean in relation to pandemics or? Um, in relation to kind of an autoethnography writing about the experiences of the community that you also were a part of. Um, yeah, for, for, for me, uh, autoethnography was uh, a, a kind of um, it was an attempt to gain back uh, control of narrative. I, I wanted to tell my my story, which was migration story, in, in my own terms. Yeah, I I didn't want to. Uh, uh, I didn't want to uh, to let it, you know, going back to this, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, so for me, it was an attempt to, 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 to gain control over narrative, and for me, it was important to. Uh, I mean, I want to emphasize that f for me, autoethnography is not autobiography. So, I want to emphasize on ethnographic part. I want to emphasize on. For me, a good autoethnography is, is when experiences are um, connected to each other. That is not about one individual um, isolated um, experience, but it is about uh, historical and, and uh, collective uh, experiences. Um, so I, I, I hope I, I was um, I, I, I could I could do that in, in my book. Uh, but that was my aim, yeah. Uh, so for me, autoethnography was that. Thank you for that. Um, I think you've concluded kind of uh, quite beautifully all the different themes we talked about today. Um, we looked at uh, the importance of time, but also 
um, waiting and, and how to think about waiting in a way that doesn't undermine people's agencies. Um, so we have about 15 minutes or yeah, 15 minutes left. And I do want to start opening up to questions. So please feel free to submit questions in the chat. I see we have a few hands raised. And also I invite the speakers, if you have questions for each other, please do um, uh, raise your hand. Um, again, the hand raising button is uh, next to the video button on the bottom. Um, so Migna, would you like to come in and start moderating questions? Yes, um, could I ask Satyana to unmute herself and ask her question if she'd like to speak it up? I'll just read it out if that's okay with you, Tatiana. Um, so her question is for Sharam about space. Um, and she says, I would like to know his thought about this. If waiting is not a passive practice, how do you think space is reconfigured in the non-places where refugees or displaced people inhabit? Can we think that hope perhaps is shaping or resignifying those spaces for waiting? Um, and, and perhaps we can have, if you would like, um, in the interest of time, I can take two questions um, together or maybe um, so if that's if Stephanie if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question and then and then people can answer in blocks or two hi um, can you hear me hi everybody thank you for this uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion it's very interesting and um, and I'm, I'm currently on my first year of international development in the, at the University of Edinburgh. So, and I'm I am uh, doing displacement and development. So this is very very pertinent as well. Um, my my quick question is considering the discussion that uh, took place about how um, Western academics are basically um, very much. Uh, given the opportunity to do research in Syria or uh, doing do research with displaced uh, refugees or migrants and they usually profit from such research because that information goes back to you know the western or anglophone university and then that creates um uh like historic um academic uh well yeah further academic research i guess um is it, is it, I, I guess it would be important to consider the, then decolonizing migration studies or decolonizing um, the discussion of uh, refugees because it, it, we all, we, I currently do so much reading and the reading that I do is by academics that, uh, that are ma mainly from you know, Western cultures doing an, an analysis on refugees and they get to travel and analyze uh, refugees' lives uh, in in camps, and uh, although that's a very laudable and respected, I I tend to feel sometimes that we don't have loads of research in Western universities created by people who are actually suffering the experience, such as the um, scholars who I, I believe Anne said was working with when when she was in Jordan, um, if I'm correct. So that's my question basically about decolonizing migration studies and the debate on refugees and displaced people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tatiana and Stephanie, uh, sorry, Stefania, sorry, I apologize. Um, and just over to you, to, to the speakers. Um, maybe I think the first question was specifically um, for Sharam and then Anne and others want to weigh in. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Tatiana asking me about space, non-space. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not convinced about the concept of non-space by Marc Auger for refugee camps. Um, uh, so, as you, you write yourself, that space is reconfigured uh, in the refugee camp. You know, it, it says that it is space. It is far from what Marc Auger wrote about or called non-space. Non so, so 
camps, uh, detention centers, or spaces of, for waiting in this context we talk about are spaces of, of um, you know, spaces of uh, full of emotions, full of activities, full of practices, full of, uh, you know, uh, movements. Um, so, um, yes, of course, hope is is very important element here to, to how this space is, is uh, shaped and reshaped. And to answering a question, I guess we should be more uh, more looking at more specific cases. What, what happens, for example, in, in Dada refugee camp with the history of Dada, you know, camp. Then look at the, the Zatari camp in Jordan, and, and you know, or, or, or camps in 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 Beirut, yeah, city camps. Yeah? So so each camp has its own history, its own you know. Uh, backgrounds and uh, th then perhaps we can discuss for each case um, so it is very difficult to generally talk about you know, waiting and space and, and uh, camps but um, yeah that was my reflection thank you for your question Uh, Anna or Karam, do you want to uh, respond to the second question? Yeah, if that's okay, I'll go first. So thanks, Stefania. Thanks for putting the finger in the wound. That's obviously like a really important issue. And I think it's important to recognize that a lot of um, migration refugee scholars are already thinking about this. So um, people have experienced like Catherine Brunn or like Elena Fidian Kasmia in the UK context, for example. Um, so I think this critique of the power inequalities um, involved in displacement research or refugee research is building up. But I feel it's important to also think about this in practical terms in this first because I'm working with Syrian agricultural academics who are all agricultural scientists, so they tend to be very practical and I like this. So I think it's important to ask ourselves what we can do in practical terms to address these issues. And one thing you can do in practical terms to come back to what Shaham said is to everything is about money. So one thing you can do in practical terms is to just transfer funds to research partners in the global south, but also give them control over their own budget. This is often limited by um, the stipulations of funders in the global north, but that's one way of giving researchers in the Middle East, for example, more agency. The other thing I'm really keen on is just, uh, for example, have outreach events, have webinars with um, simultaneous translation. So for one thing we've tried to do in the past is just to, um, when we present research results is to also provide Arabic and sometimes Turkish translation to, because it just opens up the research to a whole different set of people, including also policymakers, but also aid workers in the countries that we actually work in and who have might have like a more grounded understanding of the things we're talking about. And finally, I think what's also important is to just um, publish more in the languages of the people um, involved. So for example, if you're like me based in the in the UK, then to make a career in academia, you have to publish in English, right? But in fact, I'd be really, really keen to also co-publish in Arabic with Syrian colleagues so that um, what we write can actually also be read at, at, at universities in Arabic speaking countries. And I'm just coming back for Tunisia, where Tunisian colleagues started a new migration studies journal in Arabic. And I think these initiatives are really, really cool. And I think we should also collaborate and try to make articles available to these journals. So these are just some practical ideas about how to deal with this. Karam, do you have thoughts or should we um, have another question? Oh, just, of course, uh, it's very big uh, scale. Definitely um, from my point of view, I always, because <laughs> I always, when I work in camps or I, get asked from people in camps about what should we do and, and people my age or under I always say that you have to focus personally you can't wait but of course everything come uh, to help uh, the people in that situation is is very helpful but I always focus to tell the people who ask me personally is to focus personally of um, improving and uh, yeah I, I um, 
I think uh, it, it it definitely summarizes what uh, somehow uh, summarizes what uh, Shahram said that we are here to participate, not to integrate, and and then everything else feels kind of hierarchical. So you don't need hierarchy in in that. And I wish always to be able to bring that knowledge to something else. Can can go on. Thank you. Um, we have actually a comment from Lela and uh, a question from Melanie. And I wondered, um, in the interest of time, if if we could actually take Melanie's question. Um, we have five more minutes to go. And I wondered, Melanie, if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Thank you so much for this interesting uh, conversation. I'm also a PhD student, and currently I'm in Chile working with informal camps. Uh, and I was already reflecting about liminality. Uh, uh, I'm wondering about could liminality be as a special time of possibility, where waiting produces new forms of aspiration and hope. And the experience I have here is also how these informal uh, refugee camps uh, deal with uh, the concept of waiting, but also staying in the place, and how this uh, radicalization and how this um, hope of having a new home um, it's coming later of this process of waiting. It's I'm also interesting to, uh, uh, yeah, to hear more a bit this combination liminality as a not only as in between but also uh, this space of possibilities um, and aspiration. Is this a general question, Melanie, or do you have a specific speaker in mind? No general, because we are talking like they are all very connected. As who would like to answer? Mm -hmm. So, who would like to add their thoughts? Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Melanie, for your um, reflection and thinking um, about um, liminality. I mean. What, what can I say is, no, liminality is, is an academic term, yeah? And like, like many other terms we have been using during this conversation and in, you know, in our writings, in our teachings. Yeah? And all these terms, you know, are more or less, you know, metaphors. Yeah? Uh, we use them to uh, understand and uh, situations, but but those are not necessarily, you know, mirror the the reality of life. Yeah. So so same thing we can say, for example, for transit migration. Who 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 define a migration or is a transit or not? Who who is you know? who decide uh, what is the time limit of a transit you know, life, or, or same for liminality. Yeah? So, so going back to the question of coloniality and coloniality relation knowledge production, who is the power to give definition? Yeah? Who is the sitting in power to define terms? to use, to, to construct the language, yeah, vocabulary for talking about women, talking about migrants, talking about indigenous people, et cetera, yeah? Um, so, um, so maybe one, one form of going back to, to previous question about decolonizing knowledge production is exactly going back and Interrogating, yeah. So I use Bell Hooks' uh, words, self-interrogation. Yeah, we should self-interrogate. You know, we should integrate all, and not not reflexivity, not self-reflexivity, self-interrogation. Yeah. So who I am, why I'm doing this, 
yeah? Why I'm doing migration studies? Who, for whom I'm doing this? Yeah, going back to what Anne said, yeah, for whom we are writing, yeah, for in English or in Arabic or what, yeah? Um, so part of that is, uh, you know, interrogation of uh, uh, vocabularies, yeah? You know, liminality transit, where these terms are coming from, and uh, should we use them or not, yeah? So, 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 so my reflection to your reflection is this, yeah? To, to um, self-interrogation and, um, yeah, looking at what we are doing, which language we use. Thank you. We just have, um, well, we're out of time, but Anne and Karam, do you have any last thoughts you wanted to add? I, I can say, if I can say something related to that, that of course, when we study anthropology, when we study lived experiences, uh, the way I do is I, I, I steam from the field, stuff, from the experience I'm living, and then I try to describe. So, I mean, anthropology or terms or even migration studies is not what I think about in the first place. I think about how, what is this feeling that I have had and I need to, to, to conceptualize it. And then the, the, the term could come. And I wish I have I have uh, other term because, because of course, I mean, uh, waiting or, or this kind of living invite power and uh, I don't want to feel inferior because I am living certain experience. So I definitely, the main point is I steam first from my realization of the lived experience. So from maybe here to there. Yeah. And please. Yeah, if I can add one more word on liminality. So as anthropologists, we're obviously really keen on liminality, like not just as movement in space, but also um, as like when it comes to like reaching adulthood, adolescence as like a liminal stage and so on. And one thing that has always struck me during fieldwork is how people, how liminality lies in the eye of the beholder, right? And how we might describe liminality to people who might perceive their own situation really differently, right? And so one thing that really struck me during my PhD fieldwork and also later is that um, there were so many NGO trainings around for young people, especially young women, which were all about don't get married just yet. Like NGOs, like during my time in Jordan, were really obsessed with like early marriage. Just hold out because in the meantime, you can get this amazing education. You can get all these amazing jobs. And of course, it was kind of clear to everyone that these amazing jobs would not happen for most people for structural reasons, right? Because many things such as higher education and access to the formal labor market were severely limited for refugees in Jordan. What was also really interesting was that a lot of the young Syrian women I spoke to and I befriended chose not to wait for these futures. They chose instead to get married. And a lot of the NGOs were, and the NGO people I spoke to were absolutely horrified. But when we spoke to the Syrian families involved, one of the reasons why many young girls decided to get married is because they got married to people from their own family, like often their first degree cousin. And this was often motivated by the fact that people did not want to be further torn apart by displacement and they were already thinking about return to Syria and they thought that one day we'll go back and we can go back together if the girl just stays in the family. And I always thought that how um, this clearly highlighted how um, people had a lot of agency in deciding not to wait for this one thing that was promised to them because they were still holding out for something else, right? Um, which shows you how these, how we ascribe liminality or different parties think about liminality and different forms of waiting might go hand in hand. Thank you very much for that example, Anne. Um, that was very fascinating. Um, we've come to the end of our time for the event, uh, but I first wanted to thank once again, our three speakers for their time and, and sharing with us um, all of their amazing thoughts and, and work. And I really look forward to, I mean, we could, we could keep talking forever, but I hope we can continue this conversation offline. Um, yes, thank you. Um, we're all virtually <laughs> applauding. <laughs> and uh, thank you as well to our uh, everyone who came today to our audience. Um, and a special thank you to Migna and Dorothea for their support uh, for this event. And yeah, I wish everyone well.